Well, now we're um, in the middle of this PDF number 22, and I'm going to show you really the uh, most important example of uh, stretching and uh, shrinking as a uh, linear operator, and that's this um, NMO example, reflection normal move out. And we can certainly adapt this to um, uh, remember, uh, NMO is part of the imaging condition of um, um, of seismic migration, and DMO is the other part. Dip move out. Of course, there's uh, 3D effects. Uh, there are uh, other effects that don't, you know, that are kind of. Uh, at an angle to both uh, NMO and DMO, where they're combined. And of course, pre-stack migration solves those uh, perfectly, depending on the uh, quality of our velocity model. But uh, what this points out is, is that the principles that we use in representing NMO as a linear operator, and then also its uh, uh, conjugate transpose, we could also apply to any of these other stretches, such as the uh, uh, the Stolt migration uh, uh, omega stretch. Um, right, so we've got a uh, seismic reflection survey recording echo times away from a source. Right, so here's a, the physical setup in cross section for a shot gather in X and Z. And we have a source that goes off, and there are uh, some multiple receivers, and each of the um, the uh, first arrival times for this reflection are going to uh, bounce off the reflector here at different places, and you collect those times into a uh, uh, a a time section, uh, a travel time plot, a TX plot. And you track them um, depending on uh, you. You want to know the time uh, t versus uh, x, and as you know, uh, it follows this uh, hyperbolic diffraction path. T squared is equal to z squared over v squared plus x squared over v squared, where x is zero. That's of course where the time is a minimum. We call that zero offset time tau, and uh, it's uh, you know for a flat reflector here, it's uh, a tau is uh, the uh, depth of the reflector z divided by the constant velocity v. Um, now, here we're using the half velocity. If as you remember we did in uh, in seven oh six, just to simplify the uh, the equations. So NMO basically subtracts this term x squared over v squared, again, half velocity, uh, from, the, uh, from the, the, the square of the time. And that is uh, bringing then uh, time t equal to time tau, the 0 offset time tau. So it's putting all the, the times to tau. And so uh, notice, of course, it's, uh, uh, you know, we have to take the uh, we have to get uh, x squared over v x squared over v squared, and uh, and that's subtracted from t squared, and then we take the square root of the result to get uh, tau. So it's a it's a variable stretch, and it depends, of course, on x. And as you might imagine, um, you know, looking at this, uh, uh, you know, here's some some hyperbolic reflections for Basically, constant velocity. You can see that, or at least imagine that these reflections are all asymptotic to the same velocity, the same uh, you know v zero that uh, heads in a straight line down here. So you know, still a simple situation, but multiple uh, reflections, and the uh, uh, the the times tau are more different. Than the times t out here at large offset, and the t's get more and more similar the closer and closer we get to 
where those um, uh, where those hyperbola flanks are are all asymptotic to the same line that that uh, straight line here. Um, notice that there's no way that NMO can sample. You know, it it, it takes this area uh, above the the highest reflector, and at that's at too small a time at too large an x, and it uh, it throws it away. It doesn't address it at all. Okay, so this is a really highly nonlinear process, but we use it every day. And the other, uh, you know, dip move outs, uh, you know, migration um, imaging conditions, they work in a very similar way. There's some places where different reflectors, you know, have arrival times that are very close to each other, and there's lots of places. Uh, in the data that contain non-zero values, as usual, that uh, uh, an NMO or a migration velocity just never gets to. An imaging condition never gets to these places. Um, so after the NMO stretch, we've taken these, uh, these travel times that are very close for these different reflectors that are actually at very different tau's. And we, we put them all in the same x-axis, but now a tau axis instead of t. And the um, um, you know that that those very close times are now stretched out to be just as different as the tau's. And in most uh, codes, you know what you see is a is a increasingly low frequency <clears throat> in the NMO stretched. Uh, um, uh, traces as you go out to larger offsets. Um, you can, of course, uh, uh, apply NMO again, and you'll end up, uh, you know, stretching these um, uh, these reflections that were flat up to. Um, they're not semicircles, but they're, uh, I think, uh, inverse hyperbolas, and uh, stretching it uh, even more and throwing away what's at the bottom. Now, uh, uh, what uh, the way we're going to talk about this is that, except for the truncations at the edges, okay, the transpose, you know, and the stuff that's thrown away, the transpose of NMO is going to be equal to the inverse of NMO. So um, uh, let's let. Uh, uh, the NMO operator be represented as this linear operator, which we'll represent as a, uh, a matrix, matrix multiplication. We'll call that big N. And um, uh, since it's a matrix multiplication, uh, its action is linear. And so the linearity shows that uh, applying NMO to, uh, to the sum of data set A and B is the same as summing the NMO uh, the NMO'd uh, data sets A and B separately. Okay, so uh, and the scaling of uh, linear linearity is also true. Uh, now, what is uh, NMO? It's a square matrix. Um, in um, and you can think of it as being in a T a tau T plane. Uh, so it takes uh, the input uh, traces are this uh, um, well one trace at a time. The input trace is x, and that's a column vector that uh, uh, starts at uh, t equals zero and increases. The output is y. That's uh, a col another column vector which starts at tau equals zero and increases in tau as you go down through the vector. So uh, uh, you know this, uh, the x column vector, the input column vector gets dotted with each row, um, you know, to generate each entry into uh, y, and so the uh, the number of columns, the dimension across the top of the NMO matrix, is t or nt. Um, the dimen the height of the NMO matrix is uh, n tau, uh, and uh, it's not exactly diagonal. Uh, you could call it upper triangular. There are uh, interpolation coefficients uh, that are, uh, you know, maybe just a, uh, a column of ones, for instance. 
Um, that would be a, a nearest neighbor interpolation, or no interpolation. Uh, but uh, that's uh, confined to the upper triangle of the uh, of the matrix, and uh, does end up being uh, you know at large t large tau being quite close to the uh, the diagonal, uh, but still in the upper triangle. Outside this this band of interpolation coefficients, um, which uh, is hardly ever wider, it's, it's hardly ever uh, more than three bands. Um, the uh, uh, the NMO matrix is zero. Okay. Now you can see how this works. Um, you know the, the the shape of this band of interpolation coefficients uh, depends on the x, depends on the velocity. But basically, what it's doing is it's taking something, you know, that's that's down in time, and it's putting it very early in tau, and that's what. That's what the NMO stretch does. It takes something that's that's at large time and it moves it up to an earlier tau. So that's why it has this uh, shape, particular shape in the upper triangle. You know, and down at, at large time, the uh, uh, you know, especially for large velocities, it's uh, uh, the effect is minimal. You know, there's very little NMO correction. Okay, so let's uh, implement that uh, single-banded matrix um, for uh, nearest neighbor interpolation or non-interpolation. Um, and so we've got uh, our x's up to n t and our y's up to n tau. And if we want uh, n t to be equal to n tau, then of course our our matrix will be square, and um, we'll have this. Uh, here's our single band. Uh, with ones in it, zero, and there's exactly one sample per, uh, or there's, you know, one non-zero element per row in this uh, single-banded nearest neighbor interpolation. Okay, so um, you know, there's the tau uh, dimension. I'm sorry, the t dimension and the tau dimension, and. Uh, Here's uh, you know we can easily look at the NMO equation, you know depending on v, and we can get the shape of this band in the uh, in the t tau plane, right? Because uh, you know here it is uh, t squared is equal to tau squared plus x squared over v squared. So that defines where we put the uh, interpolation coefficients. Um, now we can uh, also define this uh, uh, n transpose, uh, and here it is. And now it has uh, very likely more than one um, uh, coefficient uh, in each row. Okay, um, so we can define n transpose to estimate the original and unstretch the NMO. So x hat is equal to uh, uh, big N transpose applied to y now, and you can see how that would work. What about inverting NMO? Okay, uh, so you know the normal equations say we should examine um, the information matrix for that, which is uh, n transpose n, and uh, so you do that, uh, and you find that uh, it's zero everywhere except some places along the diagonal. Okay, are non-zero, uh, and uh, you know with this uh, uh, single-banded one. Uh, the, all the uh, all the non-zero elements are along the diagonal. Uh, in the upper part, there are elements that are zero. Okay, so it is a singular matrix. Right, okay, um, so strictly, you know, we um, we can't strictly find uh, n trans transpose n inverse uh, because because it's singular, but um, you know we can estimate a pseudo inverse by ignoring the zeros on the on the diagonal, effectively partitioning the matrix, right, and just uh, inverting uh, each of the uh, um, each of the coefficients along the uh, um, uh, along that that are non-zero along the diagonal, and and just not bothering to invert the ones that are zero. Okay, so. Um, 
this is a, a very useful example to point out um, some prominent features of all linearized inversions, okay? uh, such as this need to uh, partition, all right? where, the, where the matrix is singular. You know, an NMO is well behaved enough that we can describe these uh, simply. Okay, <clears throat> so there are uh, inconsistent data. Okay, note that this operator only allows solutions um, that have uh, you know this particular operator here that have uh, uh, y at uh, uh, because the the band of interpolation doesn't go all the way to the diagonal in this case. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's there should be no way to get a y that's equal to zero, that, that's that's equal to anything but zero. Okay, if we want to invert for x and we're given a y that's non-zero, then no consistent x is possible. So uh, you know there can be inconsistent data for our inversion, and of course in real data, uh, naturally. Um, you know, y at n tau is going to be non-zero. So, you know, in any real case, we're going to have inconsistent data. It's not consistent with the uh, with the operator. There's no way to get it. There's also the uh, the null space of the model. All right, there are. Uh, Models x, you know, you can find uh, and invent model x, x models uh, that produce, uh, you know, n applied to x is equal to y is equal to zero. Okay, and uh, such uh, x's are in the null space. You know, those are model types, or uh, you know, as Christoph Stork called the, uh, uh, identified them. They are really eigenvectors. Okay. Uh, those types of models are um, are in the null space of this problem, okay? And uh, such you know models in the null space have no effect on the data. That means that inverting, no matter what data you have, they can't possibly estimate the models in the null space, okay? So um, you know examples of uh, of, uh, of of null space models are um, uh, x one uh, not equal to zero, okay, uh, and uh, x at t equal to zero, uh, but uh, uh, t not equal to one, okay. So uh, you know there's uh, uh, a whole spectrum of models, a whole spectrum of eigenvectors that. Uh, <clears throat> all kinds of modes of, of the model space that cannot be represented and have no effect by they can be represented but they have no effect on the data <clears throat> and so they cannot be inverted for <clears throat> and if you invert for them uncarefully then you'll end up blowing them up and the the null space uh, 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 of the model will dominate the solution which is crazy of course so Here's a uh, an NMO matrix, okay, and the uh, uh, you know this is the ta the t axis across here of the t tau plane. This is the tau axis here, and the um, uh, the NMO coefficients, the the uh, the correlation, uh, uh, the the uh, uh, interpolation coefficients are confined to this upper corner. Right there's uh, there's a long area where the whole matrix is null, you know, above a certain uh, at less than a certain t, so that's this whole left side, and then uh, at greater than a certain tau, it's also it's also null, okay, and it's those boundaries that really define uh, the inconsistent data in the null space of the model. So, um, uh, for instance, um, the um, the bottom rectangle that's uh, null in the n operator that tells you uh, where the inconsistent data will appear. Um, the uh, left side, the left rectangle that's null, um, 
tells you where the null space of the model is. All right. Um, and that's uh, uh, you know for the n operator really very easy to define. Um, but these are you know these are general features of of models and data that you have to look for in every operator that you apply in every inversion that you do. It's just particularly easy to observe these with uh, the NMO operator. And uh, you know, um, actually, uh, in uh, um, even a, even a very complicated velocity model implemented in a pre-stack depth migration, you know, for a particular trace, is going to have a very well definable t tau curve. And so, for that trace at that spot of the um, of the model. Uh, you know, for that midpoint uh, and for that offset, you'll be able to define. Um, you know, even for a uh, an advanced migration, you could define the null space of the model and the inconsistent data by drawing this uh, this t tau curve. <coughs> um, now, just to um, just to let you know, um, you know, it, it certainly is easy to. Uh, uh, you know, for this uh, you know simple single banded n to define all these uh, important properties of the uh, um, of the linear operator, um, and um, you know most linear operators are used in tandem with uh, with other linear operators. So what you're basically doing there, just like in filtering, you're concatenating n, for example, with other operators. You know, filtering and um, uh, uh, deconvolution in in uh, pre-stack migration. Um, the, uh, there's filtering for uh, anti-aliasing. Um, so all these operators get concatenated. And what do the uh, the the concatenations do? They just serve to hide the inconsistent data in the null space of the model. Okay, um, they're still there. They're just harder to figure out. Okay. I have a question. Yeah. Shouldn't y one map directly to x one? Uh, tau equals zero. T equals zero. Well, tau is. If, if is but well, zero. this is this is for a non-zero. Um, this is for a non-zero uh, offset. So, uh, uh, which I, you know, unfortunately, I also used uh, x in the. Uh, you know, x is the input trace, um, but I also use x here in the uh, NMO equation. So for non-zero x, right, you can't uh, you can't have um, um, you all you you've got to have null space of the model. We'll say for like saying we have the shots on the end, our NMO operator would start. Our matrix would have a one in the top diagonal, and then it would sort of slope, slope out. Is that correct? Uh, no, because we're, you know, this is tracking. Uh, uh, this is tracking the, um, you know, tau is really the time depth. So uh, if you think of of how a reflection will will, uh, uh, okay. So at zero offset, if you're looking at that trace. That's uh, at the end, and the source is right on top of it. Okay, then yeah, t is equal to tau. Okay, and all the migration is fi is figuring out is how the uh, how the the time maps to depth. Okay, um, but uh, <clears throat> you know you go one step away from from zero offset, and suddenly. You know, there's just just no way to get a uh, to derive uh, a tau of uh, of uh, zero. So this, I see you just so can't this do it. Is applied on each trace. Right. So the example I was thinking of would be the zero offset trace. And the uh, uh, right, right. So okay. no, notice and notice what would happen if uh, if t is equal to tau, right? Because x is zero here. Then uh, instead of having 
the band all in the upper triangle, the band is exactly the diagonal. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the zero offset, you know, um, you know, for a chirp survey, it's all zero offset. So you don't even do NMO because it's a, it's a it's a it's an identity operator, and and then you have no problem. What we're worried about is this land data, where uh, um, yeah, we can do NMO on the zero offset trace, but it doesn't do us any good because the zero offset trace is junk, right? I mean, have you seen any very informative zero offset traces in the Santa Medio data set? Just a few. Most of them, okay. Most of them are just nothing. Okay, well, that's good to know. Some of them there's coherency across. Nice, costs, really. nice. Yeah, and, and those are extremely valuable pieces of data, believe me. <laughs> Even though there's very few of them, they should be, you know, in, in some kind of generalized inversion, they should be weighted very highly. <laughs> Yeah, no kidding. Uh, yeah, you know, and and what we do in most of our pre-processing before migration is we we tend to gain them down, you know. Whereas what we really should do is is very careful, you know, muting and trace editing, you know. So we would we we would probably be better off. Um, let's see. Let me let me try to put this into the video. Um, Okay, look at this section on the left. Yeah. All right. So uh, usually, um, you know, at about the first reflection, that's where the first arrival is, and even you know, at larger times than the first reflect than the than the first arrival, there can be multiply reflected refractions, and so we're surgically muting out uh, everything from uh, uh, from that first reflection up. And and what we're doing there is we're getting we're we're, you know, cutting out the inconsistent data. Okay, so that's uh, uh, you know that that actually matches what what we should do. Okay, but it's kind of a you know surgical mutes are kind of a brutal process. Um, well, we can't really do those in an Right, right. We we have to use another. You know, we, we could we could put them out to uh, an RG. There's an RG mute program that you could use, um, but uh, or you could do it in MATLAB. Probably a heck of a lot easier. You know, um, you could probably you could probably mute in uh, Open Detect too. So those good zero offset traces that we do have, maybe multiply those by two or something. At least now, 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 now. Generally, the air wave and the surface waves are cutting across the reflections like this. You know, from from zero to uh, you know at some relatively low velocity. And I, I would I would imagine that uh, you know in any land data set, most of the traces, you know, most of the data at um, uh, you know that are underneath the uh, the the surface wave noise cone. You know most of those are are pretty garbagey, and you can't really tra trace the reflections through them. Um, and so you know most of the time we would be surgically muting uh, those away too. You know everything under that uh, that noise cone. But uh, I have seen it. I have seen it occur, and you're you're telling me that there are some traces. You know, maybe under the air wave, perhaps. You know, you you might have a, a surface wave, and then there's an air wave. Uh, in in most places, the air wave is slower than the surface waves. Maybe not in Santa Medio. Uh, and then uh, under the air wave cone, you might have you know at zero offset, you might have a little cone of of clear data. You know, that does happen. Shear waves clean up pretty well. Yeah, well, that that may be a lot of that may be due to the uh, the geophone uh, uh, arrays, the receiver arrays. You know, Satish designed those very carefully. Um, yeah, and and uh, uh, now the the other opportunity with the Santa Medio data set is that we have uh, 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 horizontal recordings, transverse and radial. So we could actually clean up the shear waves a heck of a lot better uh, by looking at those. But that's a, that's another story entirely. So, um, uh, kind of a crosstalk story. Um, so, so you know, 
with a very severe surgical mute, you know, we could eliminate the inconsistent data here, okay, and um, and uh, and that eliminates uh, a lot of the uh, uh, null, some of the null space of the model too, and then uh, uh, we could take a surgical mute that just gets in between the air wave and the uh, and the shear waves and Rayleigh waves, uh, and then leave a little cone of of cleaner data at zero offset. Um, so, uh, I mean, that would of course blow away our ability to uh, look at amplitude versus offset, but um, it might uh, produce a better structural image. Uh, and and those uh, those zero offset times are very valuable data. So if you think you can observe them, it's it's well well worth noting them. Okay. So uh, just some comments about. Uh, you know how these appear in real data and how they're how they're dealt with. Um, yeah, I've never before uh, come up with a, a what I, anything like I thought was a logical explanation for uh, uh, surgical mutes, but actually, getting rid of inconsistent data is kind of a logical explanation. Um, okay. Now uh, let's just uh, uh, let's look at this uh, uh, in a little more elaboration. Let's have a two-banded NMO matrix that uh, basically li implements linear interpolation. Okay, so uh, instead of, of setting out just ones along this uh, curve, this NMO equation curve in the uh, t tau plane, we're going to set out. Uh, you know, we're going to recognize that the curve hits be always between samples. And we're going to have interpolation coefficients uh, a and b, which uh, uh, you know interpolate between neighboring samples in in time t. And so on each row, you know a plus b is equal to one. And if it's exactly at uh, you know point b, then b is equal to one and a is equal to zero. If it's exactly at point a, a is equal to one and b is equal to zero. But usually, you know, ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time, it's uh, in between them, and uh, you know, and so you just you have it scaled so that a plus b equals one. Um, so uh, 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 you know, we have this two-banded uh, big N matrix, and um, uh, if you take uh, n transpose n, you'll find that uh, wow, lo and behold, all of a sudden it's tridiagonal. And uh, you learned in 706 just how easy and quick that is to uh, invert. Okay, so uh, that's uh, that's no problem at all. Um, and and so of course, you know that's just one of the reasons why we would use uh, NMO with uh, uh, linear interpolation. Um, does this fix the? Uh, uh, does this fix? Having this linear interpolation um, and the tridiagonal n transpose n uh, that's invertible, does that fix the inconsistent data problem? Does that fix the uh, um, the null space of the model problem? Not at all. Yeah, I, I mean you 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 know maybe you shrink your your uh, your inconsistent data, you shrink your null space of the model by one sample. That's it. Okay, maybe. Okay, so so uh, let's continue examining these um, these operators, um, you know, with this background. Now that that I've defined these general terms from this brutally simple NMO operator, um, and I and so I need to mention unitary operators. Okay, a unitary operator U conserves energy. So uh, if you have uh, x um, uh, input to an operator u and giving an output v, then uh, um, uh, x conjugate transpose uh, dotted with x uh, is equal to v conjugate transpose dotted with v. All right. Um, so a uh, uh, you know with a, a unitary operator, the energy of x and the energy of v uh, is defined to be the same. Okay. These are you know. Dot products, RMSs, if you like. 
<coughs> or mean squared. Um, and the um, and what this requires then is that uh, uh, u transpose u be equal to i. Oh, well, that's interesting. If you have an operator that conserves energy, then by definition, u transpose is also u inverse. Very interesting. OK. Um, you know, what kind of crazy operator is this? Well, the Fourier transform operator, right, by uh, uh, I forget the name of the, the Fourier transform theorem, but the Fourier transform can, uh, has to conserve energy. And uh, so thus, we know just from that that uh, uh, the Fourier transform operator w is unitary. OK? Uh, which means that, you know, after our discussion yesterday, that of course it's uh, the the uh, that means also that that the uh, the scale factor has to be distributed through the uh, um, through the uh, components of, of big W. Okay, for it to be uh, unitary, and it it has to be unitary. Um, so. Uh, uh, you know now, you know we can think back. Any any of these linear operators, which are representable as uh, as matrix multiplication, any of them at all are um, uh, that are that conserve energy. Okay, they uh, they also have this wonderful property that their transpose, their conjugate transpose, is their inverse. Okay, for a general operator B. Where um, uh, you know the output y is equal to b applied to the input x, okay? Can we find a a unitary operator that is similar to b, similar in action, but is unitary? Now, if we can find that unitary operator, then we know that the inverse of of u uh, will just be simply, very simply, be the transpose of u. And and here's how to here's how to do it, okay? You make uh, b transpose b, and you uh, take the uh, the the negative square root of that, <coughs> and uh, you know we will talk about how to how to do the uh, the negative square root of uh, of b of of a matrix, and then you operate on that with b. That's your unitary operator. Okay. So are we suggesting that? In general, an inverse does not conserve energy. Uh, right, right. If the inverse is composed, notice that that you know to get the unitary operator, we have to we have to form B transpose B. We have to take the inverse. We got to take the square root of it then, and and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> you know, first of all, we can't make a unitary operator unless it unless it's invertible. At least somehow, and then um, um, uh, you know, our, our perhaps we we will find that our our inverse does conserve energy, <clears throat> um, and then it uh, uh, you know it's <clears throat> it'll already obey these uh, these properties. <clears throat> But uh, what this is saying, uh, I agree, is that in general, inverse operators don't conserve energy. Actually, they, they throw it away, you know, and and you find that uh, you know just in simple tomography solutions, you know, in linearized uh, inversions, you you know, and, and you'll see that in every checkerboard test um, that that everybody puts in their papers, right? The amount, the energy of the anomalies they get back, is is very often, very often for these real problems. It's it's not just one tenth. It could be point uh, one percent of the energy that was put into the original checkerboard. Now, why is that? Well, because so much of the model is in the null space. You know, our rays don't go far enough. You know, for a 
for a computed uh, medical tomography, uh, you know, they make sure the rays go everywhere. And so their in inverses are much more unitary. Um, but for, uh, uh, for tomography, um, you know, earthquake tomography, you know, we just don't have enough rays. We don't have enough coverage. Um, you know, after, uh, after 60 years of, of installing stations all over the globe, uh, we have very little of the uh, ocean basins that are uh, that are sampled by by seismic stations for global tomography. Um, so uh, yeah, the the inverses are are you know they 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 aim to well well think about it you know most inverses try to minimize the energy of the uh, of the output of their of the inverse solution. Yeah. So so they're throwing away energy right and left. Okay. I just have two unrelated quick questions. So yeah. I, I tried to I tried to do the transpose for my density model and I realized that it wasn't possible with the topography and the way we handle it. And then I was thinking about the finite differencing. And it doesn't seem to me like there's a way to make a matrix form for that either. Okay. Well, well, we'll we'll you know from the, there gonna, there's going to be some corollaries to this discussion of, of unitary operators, and maybe you'll like you'll you'll have some thoughts about your operators when you see those corollaries. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, um, right. Uh, what we've uh, what we've got here. You know, we can create from, from any operator we can invert somehow, we can create a unitary operator and, uh, and, and V is equal to uh, then, uh, you know, the original output V is equal to UX and then uh, X is very simply equal to uh, U transpose V, you know, conjugate transpose. Now, um, uh, V is often close enough to Y uh, so uh, you know we we can we can often accept what the unitary operator gives us over what uh, the original operator uh, gave us, and and of course energy conservation is an advantage. Um, you know maybe not in gravity, but certainly in wave propagation and uh, shifting waves around. You really want to uh, have all pass filters uh, shifting those waves around, and you don't want to lose any wave energy. <clears throat> and what we're doing is we're defining the utility of the conjugate transpose in relation to the inverse. Okay, so wherever we're using it, this is interesting. Wherever we are 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 using the uh, uh, the conjugate transpose instead of the inversion. Get this: we are inserting. We are inserting an assumption. Of, um, of energy conservation, you know, or you think of it in, in tomographic terms, anomaly conservation. Uh, so, so there's another place where uh, why don't we prefer to use processing to use back projection and not bother with inversion? Because we're 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 actually going to conserve more of the uh, of the energy. Uh, just to uh, uh, just to make sure you understand, um, you know, how do we compute uh, uh, b transpose b uh, uh, to the negative square root? Okay, uh, for a small v b, um, you know, and, and that's pretty big these days. Uh, we can do it with eigenvector ana analysis. So we uh, we take uh, b transpose b and we diagonalize it uh, through uh, um, by finding the eigenvectors. And so uh, what we get are uh, are uh, uh, at least in the partitioned you know non singular part of uh, of b transpose b, everything is along the diagonal, uh, and it's uh, in the partitioned part it's non zero along the diagonal. 
So uh, then the uh, B transpose B to the minus 1 half is very simply you know, where we had A and B transpose B. We have 1 over square root of A and, and so forth, down to 1 over the square root of Z. Um, is our NMO operator big N unitary? Well, um, you know, our, uh, our N transpose N inverse does not exist. So we can't make a strictly unitary uh, N. But a, a partitioned N transpose N is diagonal. Okay? And if we ignore the zeros on the diagonal, uh, then we can make NMO what you might call pseudo-unitary. And uh, let's, uh, let's note some properties of this pseudo-unitary uh, NMO operator. All right? so the unitary NMO, uh, the pseudo unitary NMO, is n transpose n um, partitioned to to ignore the uh, um, the uh, zero elements of, of along the diagonal of n transpose n, and the um, and then we take uh, uh, we take each of those non-zero diagonal elements uh, uh, one over the square root of each one. Then we operate on that with the original n, and that is our unitary NMO. Okay, and um, so then uh, 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 you know we can use uh, uh, u transpose instead of u inverse, but uh, you know we're going to find that uh, um, you know in, in general u transpose u applied to x does not give you x back. Okay, so you know the partitioning has uh, has uh, uh, done that to us, and of course u transpose u is not equal to the identity matrix. All right, but there is a, an interesting property here. Okay, um, our unitary, our pseudo unitary NMO, while not identity, you know u transpose u is not identity. It is what uh, what we can call idempotent. All right, it has the same effect. You know, whatever we lose, which is of course the the inconsistent data, the null space of the model, whatever we lose, okay, in in, in that um, uh, in the application of u, we only lose it once. Okay. So uh, uh, and of course it you know, drops energy out right out of the null space of the model drops energy out of the uh, out of the uh, inconsistent data. Um, so so we uh, you know we take some input trace x and we apply our uh, our pseudo unitary uh, NMO u and then we apply the transpose of uh, of u uh, u prime. And we get you know an estimate of, of x. You know maybe let's call it x hat. Okay. Now, let's say we uh, we take uh, we get the same estimate of x. We take the original x, and we operate with it on u, and then by uh, u, by u transpose that gives us here uh, the um, the x hat, and then we do it all again. We apply uh, u. We apply u transpose. Okay. Um, the idempotent, um, the idempotent um, operator, the idempotent property of u means that those two are the same. We do u, u, u transpose on x once, uh, and we lose something, yeah. But we can do it twice. We can do u, u transpose a thousand times, a million times. And we get the same x hat. Okay, u transpose u x is equal to u transpose u applied to u transpose u applied to x. All right, idempotency. Same application, same effect with one application or, or with many. So we never lose more than than that that one pass of of losing the. Uh, the null space of the model and the and the inconsistent data. What we lose, we only lose once. So another way of putting it, you know, u transpose u squared is equal to u transpose u. 
And that's a, you know, that's a, if, if we're going to be doing some kind of iterative operation, that's a very powerful tool. Um, okay. So iterative mode doesn't conserve energy? No, because it, it, loses, uh, it loses the inconsistent data at the very least. Yeah, and, and, and the null space of the model doesn't come back when you apply U, uh, U transpose. So yeah, you, use, you lose a lot, okay? But only once. You don't keep losing. You can keep doing forward and inverse NMO as many times as you want, and you never lose any more. The energy will not keep dropping. Okay. So now through the idea of uh, the NMO operator, uh, big N, uh, which uh, we can express as a pretty simple um, um, as a as a fairly simple uh, matrix multiplication that has a uh, basically the NMO equation that is uh, defining this curve in the upper triangle. Uh, we can define uh, all kinds of uh, uh, concepts very simply. Um, that uh, exists in all kinds of uh, linear operators is inconsistent data, null space of the model, and so forth, uh, and explore uh, uh, through this simple uh, interpolation, explore some of the uh, uh, properties of these operators that we're trying to invert. Um, one of those properties is uh, the very desirable property of unitary operators, uh, which conserve energy, and thus, uh, according to that definition, um, give us that uh, incredible property where the uh, the conjugate transpose is uh, equal to the uh, inverse. So uh, u prime u or u transpose u then uh, for u being a unitary operator um, that gives the I identity operation. Uh, and we've already explored how the Fourier transform uh, capital W the DFT, uh, which of course conserves energy, is uh, our favorite example of that, and uh, we can get a uh, we can derive if we can invert uh, b transpose b for some any operator b, if we can invert that. Then we can uh, find a uh, unitary equivalent uh, to that uh, to any operator, uh, assuming that uh, that inversion works. Uh, and uh, you know, usually what you have to do is. Uh, uh, find the uh, uh, the eigenvectors to diagonalize the uh, the B transpose B matrix, and then it's very simple to uh, invert and take the square root of each of the elements along the diagonal, uh, at least where uh, those elements are non-singular. So the um, uh, that leads to uh, a discussion of um, well, we can't really get the uh, uh, because the uh, the n transpose n for a simple uh, uh, NMO correction uh, n transpose n um, is uh, highly singular. Um, we can't uh, uh, we can't get a uh, we can't invert it, and so uh, we can't get a um, a unitary uh, representation of that, but uh, there's an additional property here, uh, item potency, which tells us that um, whatever we lose in one application of u and then uh, u transpose, we only lose it once. We can have additional applications of the same operator, so uh, you know u transpose u squared gives the same effect as u transpose u. What we lose, we only lose once, um, and that uh, is going to be true of uh, a lot of operators that uh, we might look at going forward. So now I take I'd like to uh, uh, take a look at um, uh, how to make uh, NMO pseudo unitary. Just to finish off uh, mm -hmm. this uh, set of notes, number twenty-two. Uh, if we have a double-banded linear interpolation. Uh, big N, NMO operator, then as I said uh, earlier, uh, N transpose N uh, 
let's uh, uh, let's call it T because it's tridiagonal. So just to remind you what that looks like, um, we have uh, three diagonals. Uh, we have the main diagonal and two side diagonals. And uh, we talked a lot in 706 about uh, how easy it is and how quick to um, uh, invert that uh, tridiagonal matrix. So now let's uh, define the pseudo-unitary uh, NMO. Uh, so uh, we have uh, B uh, inverse uh, times N. That's going to be give us our unitary uh, operator. And uh, B is a bidiagonal matrix that is um, a factor of uh, N transpose N equal to T. So T is equal to uh, B transpose B. All right. Now, um, you, know, you know, see, we have to uh, factor, uh, uh, you know, to get uh, the unitary operator, we have to factor B here. Um, I mean, it's easy to form the tridiagonal matrix. That's just N transpose N. But how do we get B? Well, we gotta we gotta factor it out of uh, out of T, and that's possible with a Cholesky uh, decomposition, which is similar to spectral factorization. So if we do that, uh, let's check uh, the unitary operation of uh, of this new uh, equivalent uh, um, unitary equivalent NMO, which is uh, U. So U transpose U is equal to B inverse transpose applied to N transpose applied to N applied to B inverse. Okay, and we can uh, sort of collect things together, and what we've got is uh, B inverse transpose um, applied to B transpose applied to B applied to B inverse. All right, and so uh, the uh, uh, U dot uh, uh, U transpose U then. Uh, is equal to, uh, as you can see here, you know, B inverse transpose times B transpose has got to give I the identity matrix, and B applied to B inverse has also got to give I, and I applied to I is also I. So um, U transpose U proves that uh, is equal to I, and that proves that U is unitary. Uh, let's examine uh, what this looks like. U is equal to uh, N B uh, inverse, and uh, that's an all-pass filter. Um, B uh, coming from a Cholesky uh, decomposition, like the spectral factorization, that uh, denominator is minimum phase, uh, which means that it must have uh, a uh, uh, an NMO stretch correction uh, built into it, right? Uh, we uh, um, we have to uh, decrease the uh, uh, the power uh, whenever we do some NMO stretch. Um, now the uh, numerator n, you know, which of, of course to be an NMO, it's got to do time shifts. It's not minimum phase, okay? So that's an all-pass filter, all right? That fits our definition given again back in 706 of an all-pass filter, and uh, so that's what the unitary NMO is going to look like. All right, so I want to sum up uh, what I the key points that I've said about conjugate operators. All right, uh, number one, many operators have well-known and quite simple conjugate transposes, um, and when we find the conjugate transpose, we can um, instead of only being able to you know we can model of course once we have the modeling operator, that's the first step. But um, you know the next step was uh, in the past often um, trying to invert the modeling and do inversion. Now we have the additional option of doing instead of inversion, doing processing, which is conjugating, uh, conjugate transposing the modeling, and uh, uh, so that's uh, that's where we get this idea of processing versus inversion again. Uh, number two. The conjugate program is going to be very similar to the modeling program, and uh, we can verify quite easily just by making uh, uh, forward and conjugate uh, calculations on, on random or real data sets. We can verify uh, uh, easily you know, to six digits that uh, uh, we've got the correct conjugate. 
in a least squares inverse, number three, the conjugate transpose operator does most of the work. The inversion um, only adds some amplitude scaling. Okay, now it doesn't. Of course, it's not a uniform amplitude scaling, but um, you know, it's uh, uh, there's a lot of aspects uh, uh, about the um, you know where the uh, uh, the null space of the model is, where the inconsistent data are. All of those aspects are you know really contained uh, in the um, in the conjugate transpose operator. And uh, of course, they cause trouble in the uh, inverse, um, and they can lead the uh, iterative inverse to blow up. But um, uh, you know, really, most of the work and most of the problems are right there in the conjugate transpose operator, and uh, the inversion, if we can get it, uh, is is just some scaling. Now, for uh, uh, unitary operators. The conjugate transpose equals the inverse, and of course the Fourier transform is unitary. Now, uh, simple uh, mapping uh, exercises uh, and examples illustrate that, uh, uh, such as NMO, illustrate uh, where we will find our inconsistent data and our model null spaces. And operator partitioning overcomes sim singularity, inconsistency, and null models by finding Pseudo unitary operators and their pseudo inverses. Okay, and pseudo unitary and pseudo inverse combinations are idempotent. Okay, uh, yeah, you lose something when you apply the pair of them, but uh, at least you only lose it once. So in a um, in a uh, iterative uh, uh, fashion, you uh, you at least can limit your losses. All right. Um, and we're going to go on now to some examples. Uh, um, the last uh, couple lectures in this class are going to be uh, uh, a combination of the uh, examples of where we we take these uh, operator concepts, um, you know, unitary um, conjugate transpose, uh, invertibility. Um, what we find in the in the data and uh, what's invertible in the data, what's invertible in the model, and um, we're going to apply that to the to the problem of migration, talking about least squares migration, um, you know, iterative migration, uh, reverse time migration, and uh, these topics. Uh, considering that we're focusing this year on uh, on imaging and migration.